Hello, hello, hello. Welcome to uh, our amazing keynote. Oh man, I'm getting so many hearts. I love the hearts. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> we are going to give folks just another like minute or two to come in from their session, settle in um, to the room, get comfortable. Um, I would love to see in the chat how how did the um, yoga, how did yoga go? How was the networking lounge? Which one did you go to? Did you go to both? Uh, I'm, I'm curious. How did it go? Fantastic yoga. Ira, I'm glad you enjoyed it. Yoga was great. Shelby. Oh, it was so soothing. Yes. Uh, Shirley's voice just like puts you in the right place of mind too. She has the best voice for it. Good day, Wanda Graham. The yoga was amazing. I truly feel better. That makes my heart happy. That makes me happy. It was great. Relax. Yoga was so relaxing. The uh, Carmelita, hey there. Networking lounge was great. Awesome. Centered and ready to go. Great voice. Good stuff. Good stuff. I, I'm, I'm happy. Oh, my video is lagging. Oh, no. Is my video lagging for everyone? Can you let me know in the chat? Okay, someone, Shelby said, need yoga every morning. Yes, I'm lagging. Yes, a little bit. Okay. Hmm. Um, let's see. Let me uh, close some things. Maybe it's because I have too many things open. Which, you know, I know y'all know how that is. When you have 15,000 tabs open, it's just like, why? Why? You can't look at all of them at the same time. <laughs> all righty. I, yeah, I can go into the, the low definition mode, but I'm really concerned about uh, it looking grainy. So um, let's see what happens. I'm only here for a short period of time, so I hope that uh, me changing to low definition has helped a little bit. If I look a little grainy, that's all right. It's okay. We're, we're here. We're here together, and that's all that matters. Um, okay, so let's get started. Uh, for folks who are, um, who are here and would like to experience the summit in Spanish, a live Spanish translation, uh, all you'll need to do is click the little puzzle piece. There's a, a whole list of icons there, and at the very bottom of that list next to the chat, is a puzzle piece. You click on that puzzle piece, it will allow you to have other options to navigate to the live translation and also uh, live Spanish closed captioning. For my friends here, my community members here that I would like to experience the summit with live English closed captioning, you'll go to a different place. Uh, in the middle of your screen, the event screen, right there by your camera, uh, excuse me, not by your account, right by the emoticons and the raise hand, there's a CC button right there. You'll click that for live closed captioning. Just know that when you turn on your live closed captioning, um, it's sometimes difficult to see all of the presenters and all of the screens and the live closed captioning. So you may have to adjust a little bit so you can see everything on one screen. Um, and then also uh, for those of us who are here that are experiencing and and uh, this session with American Sign Language, for you to see uh, our interpreters, I encourage you to expand your screen. So on the right-hand corner of the event page, there's a little box with four arrows going in four different directions. Click on that button, and then it will expand your screen, and you'll see Gay and Jasmine um, providing us with interpretation. And you'll be able to see everybody in the presentation all at one time. All right, so with that being said, I um, want to also talk to you all about a couple of things. Uh, so the networking lounge that we had just now, if you attended the networking lounge, can you please put a heart in, and let me see some hearts go up and some hand claps and some wows if you attended 
uh, the networking lounge. Thank you, okay. So lots of folks had the opportunity. I know we had a little bit of a late start with the networking lounge. So there was some misdirection on how to get there, where is it located. It's funny how you can get lost in the internet, but yes, it's, it's possible. So um, if uh, with that being said, we are going to invite our peer support specialists back uh, to uh, host a session later in the summer. Uh, we will make sure that we announce that to you all. Um, make sure that you're signed up for our newsletter so you don't miss that announcement. And if I could ask um, our wonderful co-director, Tracy Levins, to drop the link in the chat for our newsletter. Um, make sure you register for or sign up for our newsletter. Uh, and when we announce this kind of second round of this peer support specialist opportunity, you'll be the first to know about it, okay? All right, so um, a couple of other things before we get started with Kalechi's awesome PowerPoint presentation and speaking and all of the things before she gets started. Um, please make sure you spread the word about the summit. It's not too late. We have a full day of wonderful sessions and awesome opportunities to network. So it's not too late to spread the word we have the QR code here on the screen. Also, you can type in, and, and I'm gonna ask one of my colleagues, either Tracy or Suki, to please put in the chat, uh, or Carrie, the link to um, the registration for the summit. Uh, you can still share this with your network, your colleagues, your friends, your neighbors. Um, we would love to see them here. Even if they can't make it, if they register for the event, they can still come back um, a month from now, a year from now, and have access to the recordings and all of the resources. So um, please be sure to share that with, with folks. So we were gonna do a quick tutorial uh, and orientation of all of the icons, but we are running a little bit short on time. I just want to go uh, make a, one quick announcement about our summit engagement champions. Um, yet on, on the day one of the uh, summit, we had four champions. These were our top engagers with the platform and with other attendees. You'll see the day two champions are here as well. So yeah, let's give some congratulations to our champions. Uh, and day three, who knows? We'll see soon. Uh, we are going to leave the summit open after the award ceremony or maybe like an hour or two. That way it gives you some more opportunities to chat with other people or watch those lightning talks and get those points up. So you have plenty of opportunity to um, gain more points. And gaining points, y'all, is it's not hard. It's easy. We're, we're trying to make it really easy, but also fun, right? So just by entering the event, everyone has 100 points. All right. If you watch three lightning talks today, 150, if you were to do all of the things in purple, like submitting your address to the intact partners, sending a couple of direct messages and replying to those messages, you can easily have 630 points. You can do that in your sleep. Right. Uh, but don't go to sleep. Stay awake. <laughs> don't, don't, let me take that back. Don't do it in your sleep. Please stay awake with us. Um, and then also ask three questions. You can, if you use the Q&A while Kalechi is presenting, put some questions in the Q&A for her. Same for Jane in the breakout rooms. Um, so you can easily receive over a thousand points. Um, and we have some wonderful prizes that we're giving away, an Amazon gift card, tea time with me, virtual tea time with me. Um, so lots of really great opportunities to engage with the platform and with other attendees. All righty, so I am going to, with that, pass the mic over to our, um, our moderator for, day, for today, Dr. Tanisha Freeman Foster, and she will get us started.
Thank you so much, Ashley, and welcome again, everyone. Good morning and good afternoon. Welcome to The Power of Choice, Surviving Suicide from a Black Lens by Kalechi Ubozo. I am your intact session moderator, Dr. Tanisha Freeman Foster. Let me start by saying this, this is a critical topic and a necessary conversation. Simultaneously, we would be remiss if we did not acknowledge that it can cause or exacerbate stress and other undesirable emotions. We encourage you to identify a positive coping tool and remember that we also are hosting a wellness room. Please start by sharing one self-care tool that you can implement today. Please share that in the chat. All right, so moving forward and introducing our speaker, Kalechi Ubozo is a Nigerian-American published writer, mental health advocate, and facilitator. She has over a decade of experience in working in the mental health system in California. Her areas include research and advocacy, community engagement, suicide prevention, and peer support. Her story of surviving a suicide attempt has been featured in the S Word documentary, The Oprah Magazine, and CBS This Morning with Gail King. Kalechi is most passionate about elevating marginalized voices of those whose lived experiences include enduring psychiatric mistreatment. Kalechi has graciously provided us with a copy of her slide deck and other resources. Additionally, Intac is gifting limited access to the S Word documentary to all summit participants. All of these resources can be found within your resources tab on the right side of your screen. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming our amazing and bold speaker, Kalechi Ubozo, to our virtual stage. Welcome, Kalechi. Thank you so much, Dr. Tanisha, and welcome everyone. Thank Thank you so much for coming. I see all the claps and the hearts. It just warms my heart. Um, so yes, I'm Kalechi Ubozo and I am presenting from Occupied Ohlone Land, also known as Oakland, Bay Area. Um, and before we dive into content, um, Dr. Tanisha was so kind to let us know about some activation warnings, but I want you to know what to expect from me as we're creating just as a tenant of trauma-informed care. So we are gonna be talking about suicide, sexual trauma and historical racism, and specifically centering the black experience and lived experience. Um, I will be sharing headlines, not details, if that makes sense, but I'm gonna share my story and other stories I have received consent to share, which really demonstrates what happens when we don't slow down and harm is created instead of help. Um, and in the dreaming up of this space, you know, I really wanted to make sure there was time for dialogue. A lot of times you go to a keynote and you get all this information. Um, but in this topic, which is so taboo, um, I really want folks to ask questions and we, we're really going to make time for that. So I also want to let you know, I have really good boundaries. So this is an invitation to ask what's on your heart. Some of this conversation may activate you. And as much as you can stay present, I hope you can stay present. Um, but I also know that this is going to be recorded. So you can always return to the content. Um, when I'm activated, I do deep breathing. I do coloring. I hold on to my fur baby Atticus. I also have tea beside me. So again, this is just a reminder to do whatever you need to do to resource yourself. Um, and the last thing I want to let you all know is the bigger disclaimer for today is that I may say some things that you've been taught differently about, or you have some really strong opinions on, and you are always at choice in your life, right? I'm sharing this because how we've collectively been trained to handle, talk about, or deal with suicide is not working for our Black communities. Okay, so before we begin, um, here's an invitation to take a deep breath. I really, I do this because I need it. But, and with any invitation, you can decline, but feel free to take in a deep breath with me. And release. <sighs> On the next breath, I'm gonna set an intention for how I want our space to be. And release. <sighs> and on this last breath, 
I just want to send gratitude to everyone who's in the room, gratitude for folks who've been impacted by suicide, who've lost people to suicide, who are suicide attempt survivors, and I'm with you. And so I'm just going to take a, another deep breath in and release. For those of you who joined, thank you. And for those of you who didn't join, thank you for listening to your boundaries. All right. I'm going to go ahead and share a poem from our anthology, We've Been Too Patient. She wasn't crazy. She wasn't crazy, but the world had a way of making her feel so. You try being a black goth girl in Stone Mountain, Georgia. She liked vampires and Morrissey and how darkness wrapped around her like a warm, familiar blanket. She was always too sensitive and too reactive, felt every feeling at high voltage, she wasn't crazy, but she said whatever she wanted, spilled words from her lips like red wine on white carpets. She left many stains. They called her Crazy K and it stuck. She never slept. She crawled up fire escapes to hang off the edge. Longingly looking down, she flirted with death. She wanted to know if she let go, would she be free? She imagined a place where all the people loved her. She wasn't crazy, but when grandma, the ultimate matriarch who kissed her thick eye face and marveled at her choice of combat boots and fishnets, well, when grandma died, the darkness welled up and started choking her. She wanted to stop the world and get off because when your world ends, but you're still alive, there is something crazy about that. She was 13 when she wrote the first suicide note. It was on a post-it. She wasn't crazy, just to sink. She wasn't crazy, just honest. She didn't want to live. She got messy. A friend found the note, called her mom, and all her mom could say is, why, 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 baby? The words left her. Was she crazy? But she didn't feel crazy. They stripped her down like an animal, took her shoelaces, put her on suicide watch. She squirmed on an uncomfortable cot. She felt pretty crazy then. The psych ward for kids smelled like every hospital, bleach with a stench of death and disappointment. Even in this place, there was a psych ward hierarchy. They separated the kids with the eating disorders from the crazy kids. The frail looking teens never made eye contact, but the other kids got it. They all dreamed of McDonald's French fries and getting out of the sterile purgatory, this life-size pause button. One day, little Christine tried to open the locked door, but it wouldn't budge. The security guard said, we lock it to keep the crazy people out. She laughed uncontrollably, but in hindsight, she could see he was right because when she left the psych ward, she created a paper mache mask of glitter and light. She smiled until her eyes bugged out. She stopped wearing liquid eyeliner and made everyone feel comfortable. She said all the right things and lied about the darkness. See, all better now. The moment she stopped telling the truth, well, that was the moment she was truly crazy. Whew. Hopefully it's clear that I think crazy is a horrible and harmful word and I'm trying to flip it on its head. Um, and if that isn't clear, this is the disclaimer for that. So I wanna share my story with you all. I was born and partially raised in Brooklyn, New York, and I was just a different kind of kid. My favorite color was black. I loved vampires. I was poetic and artistic, and I always had big emotions. Basically, I was goth. My parents divorced, and my mother wanted to start her own primary care practice. So she moved us from Brooklyn, New York to Stone Mountain, Georgia. Take a minute to imagine a black goth girl moving from New York to the rural South in the 90s. I'm sure now it would be a cute, heartwarming Netflix show with one season, but a really dedicated fan base. But unfortunately for me, growing up in the segregated South and splitting my time between a predominantly white private school and my all black neighborhood was anything but humorous. In the South, I faced racism, colorism, isolation, and rejection. I wasn't accepted by my own community or by my classmates. I just felt out of place everywhere. Eventually, my grandmother moved down to help raise me. Let me tell you about grandma. So my grandmother loved me unconditionally and swore up and down I was beautiful. We spent our afternoons watching Murder, She Wrote and Matlock and Catching Fireflies. When I'm at school, she watches my Tamagotchi, which for you vintage folks like me is a digital pet. She thought every meal should include a dessert 
And for some sweet moments, the awkwardness of being a teenager, navigating identity, heartache, rejection from my community, all of those things. I know I'm accepted here. When my grandmother got sick and started declining in health, I also declined in health. And when she died, my world fell apart. Now, it wasn't just her death. It was rejection from my Black community. It was racism at school. It was going to be real at 13. It was insecurity with boys. I struggled with suicidal ideation and I attempted. My mom was terrified and she had no real options. So she took me to an inpatient psychiatric hospital. So the psych ward for kids was really scary. Not only was I treated like I had done something bad, um, my teddy bear was confiscated, my shoelaces were taken, no one is telling me why any of these things are happened, but I felt so vulnerable being in a hallway with strangers on a cot with bright fluorescent lights for suicide watch. But the absolute worst part was what the hospital staff told me. They said, I'm mentally ill and I'll be mentally ill my entire life. And according to them, people with untreated depression, all people will eventually try to kill themselves. And without medication and psychiatrists, I will surely die. And even with treatment, it will be difficult and next to impossible for me to keep a job or a relationship. They say I have a brain disease, a chemical imbalance. My best hope is maintenance, but I will never recover. I am broken. I was 13 when I learned it was better to lie. I didn't know what I was hearing wasn't true. I had never heard about the recovery model. I had never heard about the consumer movement. I had never heard about peers or peer support. And no one ever spoke of healing. What I wish had happened was that someone showed me coping skills for dealing with losing a loved one, navigating isolation and racism. I wish someone had asked me what a world might look like that would feel livable to me. I also received some hurtful messages from my family and friends like, you're selfish, black people don't try to kill ourselves, we don't have time to get depressed, pray it away. And I don't think their intent was to hurt me. I think they were really scared. But when you tell someone to stop talking about what they're feeling, it doesn't mean that feeling goes away. Instead, I pretended to be, okay, I learned, don't share what's going on because if you tell people the truth, you'll get locked up again, you'll be in trouble, you'll be rejected. So I did my best to put on this persona of someone who was always happy. And I also distracted people from myself by taking care of them. I did this black woman labor of taking care of other people emotionally and I hid. And I did this for years into my twenties. We don't ask people who are smiling what's wrong. We have lost a lot of black celebrities to suicide recently. Stephen Boss, AKA Twitch. Chelsea Crist, former Miss USA, Ian King, Regina King's son, and more. And something I hear over and over again is they seem so happy. You seem so happy. And when we look at the posters for mental health or even the imagery for suicide prevention, right, you know what it looks like. It's usually someone with their hands up or their, their hands in their head and they're looking visibly pained. And yes, some people visually express everything and other people hide how they are feeling. So I wanna invite this experience into the conversation because of how black folks have learned to survive. Many of us have learned to mask our feelings, make jokes, distract or redirect. My mom said of a later suicide attempt in my twenties, wow, you really hid this. I had no clue you were struggling. It was hard to ask for help because I was afraid it would be harmful. Like when I was in my teens. So as you learned, and many of you have maybe already watched, um, I'm part of this film called The S Word, where I talk about another suicide attempt following a rape in my 20s. One of the things that isn't covered in the film that I wanna share with this group is that before the sexual assault, I tried to get help from therapists and I was turned away because I brought up the word suicide and they said I was too sick. I also actually voluntarily checked myself in a psych hospital because I was having really intense thoughts and I was afraid I was gonna act on them. In my experience as a black woman who quote unquote presents well, racism shows up in an interesting way. I'm often not taken seriously or people don't believe me when I'm asking for help. I frequently get labeled high functioning because I can articulate that I'm in pain, which for some reason negates my pain. So I want to say I was really trying to find a way to stay, 
but I didn't have great resources. They pretty much immediately released me, said, you're fine. And I was assaulted a few weeks afterwards, and I attempted several days after my assault, and I was forced into a psychiatric unit. There I had a nurse look me up and down and say, you're strong. Don't let yourself get raped again. And the treatment modality, it was coloring and watching Silence of the Lambs. I'm going to take a deep breath because I know that's heavy. I don't share this with you to shock you. It is to say that for someone who was trying not to die, first I got turned away from help. And then the forced help I received was nearly as traumatic as the feelings and the suicide attempt itself. So with this trauma, what does healing look like? I want to acknowledge that I have family privilege. Um, not only is my mother an advocate and a supporter who asks and listens to what I need, she's a black mama and she's protective of me and she's a primary care doctor. So she was able to work connections to get me trauma-informed in intensive outpatient programming that was healing focused. And that treatment was expensive. I was not going to be able to afford that on my journalism salary. I was able to have a combination of peer support with other survivors, trauma-informed therapy, psychoeducation that helped me understand what was behind the suicidal thoughts and feelings and develop coping strategies for them. And I feel that services and approaches that are person-centered, trauma-informed should be accessible and available to everyone. And I know I'm really lucky that I got good care and I know that not everyone has those resources in their life. So where am I today? Well, today I'm a mental health advocate. Um, I am a writer, I'm a certified liberatory coach, I am a public speaker, and I'm a consultant. Uh, I am involved in local and national mental health advocacy. And in 2019, my co-editor, co that's, that's them, uh, LD Green and I published the book, We've Been to Patient Voices from Radical Mental Health. And this anthology places people with lived experience in the driver's seat of our own narrative. It's now featured curriculum at NYU and Boston University in Cal State East Bay. I love my life. And I think sometimes people want to hear me say, and you never had another suicidal thought, right? That's not true. I still have suicidal thoughts and I also have a plan for them. I have an amazing support system, which includes my mother, my husband, my peers, my therapist, and my friends. Thank you so much for listening to my story. I'm gonna take a sip of water. So I wanna share some historical context because I think there's a narrative around the black community, mental health and suicide that hasn't been nuanced very well. A lot of times when we talk about black people not accessing mental health, mental health care, you may hear, well, it's taboo. We don't talk about mental health, but we don't always dig into the history of like, why is this and bring into the context of structural and scientific racism that black people have faced in the field of psychology. So in 2021, the American Psychiatric Association apologized to BIPOC communities for its support of structural racism in psychiatry. This is after we saw a lot of apologies from institutions following the public and very brutal murders of Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor, and George Floyd in 2020. But what does structural and scientific racism look like? Well, it looks like diagnosing enslaved people with negritude, which is the irrational desire for Blacks to become white or trypanomania, which was a mental illness label given to enslaved people who ran away. Take a minute to think about that. To diagnose the desire to be freed from brutal captivity as a mental illness underscores a problematic history Black people in the U.S. have with psychiatric or association with mental illness. Let's talk about segregated psych wards. At the end of the 19th century and into the 20th century, mental health experts believed that treating blacks and whites in the same psychiatric facilities would negatively affect the healing of white patients. Let's be clear, conditions in those early asylums were unsanitary and isolating for white patients. But for black patients, the conditions rivaled those most brutal under enslavement. Black patients were housed outdoors or near the institutions or in local jails. While white patients healed inside, mental health treatment for black patients was hard labor, cutting wood and working on the farm. These hideous examples of psychiatric abuse move us into, continued into the 20th century for black Americans. Things like forced sterilization, which was disproportionately directed at black women who were declared mentally defective by the courts 
and surgical lobotomy targeting African-Americans from 1930s to 1960s. And in the 1960s, the DSM-2 was changed to add aggression and hostility as signs of schizophrenia as a trend to overdiagnose and overmedicate Black people because of their civil rights belief, which we can clearly see in this um, ad for the drug Haldol from 1974, which shows an angry Black man alongside the text, cooperation often begins with Haldol. While the Black community is not a monolith, there are cultural beliefs that are widely known within our community that impact our collective view of mental illness and treatment. I've been told by my community that Black people don't have mental illness. That's a white thing. We've got tough skin. But where do these beliefs come from? The belief that Black people feel less pain than white people dates back to slavery and still persists today in the medical treatment of Black people. We see this show up in maternal health too. Enslaved Black people were described as being immune to mental illness because they did not have property, engage in commerce, vote, or hold public office. Unfortunately, this immunity hypothesis and having thick skin have become adopted cultural beliefs in the Black community. So it's no accident that Black families ripped apart by slavery and carceral systems would double down on narratives of being strong or getting over it or keeping family secrets as a protective measure. This is also the impact of the racism that the APA is apologizing for. Speaking of being strong, I wanna share some wisdom from Yolo Achille from Beam, who I heard the term martyr nurturing from, which gave me a name to what I was experiencing, what I was doing. Martyr nurturing is a caring style that censors the desecration and denial of self as a mechanism for both supporting and maintaining control over others. So this looks like avoiding help or being cared for, always saying yes, and trying to rescue people and feeling mad at others because of the things we said yes to, right? Like I had never heard of this and I was like, oh my gosh, this is what I've been doing my whole life. And this is what I've seen black women do a lot. Now, Let's take a look at our traditional crisis model. I want to uplift this wisdom from Julian Plumidor. And I just want you to sit with a question. Where do choices show up in these models? Our traditional crisis model really prioritizes the resolution of a crisis and not the safety and health of a person in crisis. There's a big difference between intervening and responding. All right, we're gonna get into a data slide. Um, I'm gonna take another deep breath and invite you all. This is all heavy stuff, but we're gonna get on the other side of it, okay? We are centering black suicide because while during the pandemic, the overall rates for suicide decreased, rates of suicide among black youth have risen faster than any other racial ethnic group in 20 years, which means it's time to have this conversation. For so many years, I used to say that su suicide impacts the black community. And what I'd re received from researcher was a resounding, no, it really doesn't. The black community has low rates. That also doesn't include data for suicide attempts. And black researchers who examine health disparities are historically underfunded. Has the data caught up with this or was 2020 so relentless upon black communities with the pandemic and the public racialized murders of black people? I can't say for sure, but we do know that racism is actually a risk factor for suicide. I do wanna acknowledge that a lot of people think suicide is a symptom of untreated mental illness, but that's a myth. Suicide cannot be contributed or attributed to a single cause, like my story with a lot of pieces. Um, I'm gonna read a few of these data points and don't worry, you'll have this for later. The rate of suicide actually increased by 60% for black males who are 10 to 19. And also I wanna bring in the LGBTQ plus community in as well. Um, adolescents of color who identify as this community are especially, especially at risk for suicide attempt and half of all LGBTQ youth of color reported discrimination based on their race and ethnicity, including 60% of black LGBTQ youth. And Kevin Berthia, who is a black suicide attempt survivor says, we are dying from suicide at an alarming rate and we're not talking about it. Okay, this next slide may be a little controversial, but we have to have tough conversations when we talk about suicide from a black lens. We need to acknowledge the risk of criminalization when people are trying to get help for themselves or their loved ones. For too many people, a mental health condition or incident results in criminalization, persecution, or death by police. 
So the Reuter Family Foundation indicates in their report that 50% of individuals killed by police in the United States had disabilities, and a large percentage of those were people with mental health conditions. And I've been so excited by 988 and also um, a little sad uh, in some ways. So 988, um, and I, I talked to other mental health advocates about that, but 988 is our greatest opportunity to separate crisis intervention and policing, and a lot of places are bringing them together when we need to be separating them, says Jess Dolman Rainey. And Karis Jan Myrick says, you know, that without centering black and brown folks in the development of 988, we are more likely to have the same devastating outcomes. So advocacy, this is a call for action, a call for advocacy um, to separate these, these institutions. All right, let's move on. Thanks for letting me take a pause and <laughs> drink water. So I might have mentioned a few times that the black community is not a monolith. And there is diversity within our community, intersectionality with our identities, experiences with foster care, being unhoused and incarceration. So I wanted to include some insight from other Black suicide attempt survivors. So let's introduce them. So here we have Ashley Albert. Um, Ashley is a certified peer specialist, suicide prevention, foster care, domestic violence activist, and she is from Seattle, Washington. She was formerly incarcerated as a young adult, and she aged out of the foster care system. She's a parent who was affected by child welfare system, and she's the first parent in Washington to legally enforce and modify an open adoption agreement and win. She's a co-author of Owning Your Own Story, Claiming Your Power, a guide for talking about domestic violence and child protective services. And Ashley says, you know, it's not even talked about our community. It's not something being discussed. Even if someone knows a family member attempted suicide, there's not like a group meeting to talk about it. There's a lot of privacy that happens. Okay, that's Ashley. Next, we have Kevin Berthia. You might have seen, um, there's a photo of him that like went viral years ago, um, but he's a suicide prevention advocate and public speaker. He's based in Oakland. He's the founder of Kevin Berthia Foundation. And in 2005 at 22, he attempted to take his own life by jumping from the Golden Gate Bridge. And it wasn't until eight years later that he met and was reunited with the officer who talked him back to safety, whose name is also Kevin. <laughs> so Kevin Briggs and Kevin Berthia. And Kevin says, listen and not with an agenda. We never ask their why. We assume we know the how, the who, the what, and the why, but we never ask their why. You're losing connection when you don't listen to understand. We're the most unheard race in the world. Next up, we have Karis Myrick. Um, Karis is the vice president of Inseparable, a mental health policy shop. She's also a national mental health leader. Um, and she's the host and developer of Unapologetically Black Unicorns. She's located in LA. Um, and Kara says, I wish therapists and others would try to take time to figure out different ways to have the conversation around suicide. We did it through gameplay by playing shoots and ladders, bringing in food into therapy sessions because black families, when we congregate, um, it's in the kitchen while we're cooking and using less of a Western model of the therapist in the chair and the client on the couch. So that's Karis. Morgan McLawn is a black and non-binary disabled queer person living with chronic illness based in Florida. And their first experience with involuntary hospitalization happened at 14. And he believes that folks with lived experience should be treated as experts of their care and their survival and wellness is tied to having voice and autonomy in the conversation around their care. Morgan says, I just needed someone to tell me, okay, I hear your pain. I hear that you're struggling right now. You know, really ask me what I needed. And last but not least, um, and for their safety, ID uh, requested a pseudonym and no photo. ID is based in the Pacific Northwest and is a policy strategist and says, I think deep seated internally, our people know this line isn't where we belong and it's caused us great harm to our people, contributing to chronic illness, addictions and mental health issues, which in turn has caused many people to want to die. All right, so I ended up talking to this group and they're an amazing group of people because again, I wanted to hear my story, but also we're not all the same, right? So I wanted you to hear other people's perspectives. So this question, the first question I asked everyone was, what messages did you hear about suicide from the black community? Why do you think talking about suicide is still so taboo in the black community? 
So at first everyone said, you know, I didn't really hear, we didn't really have a lot of conversations. We didn't, there wasn't really messaging. And then later it was like, well, I did hear it's a sin to commit suicide. We don't air our dirty laundry. Suicide isn't a black people thing. We are strong. You need to pray it away. God won't give you more than you can handle. You're being dramatic. Kevin didn't even hear the word mental health until he was 19 and he was hospitalized for a suicide attempt. Morgan heard, you're just trying to get attention. And Karis, um, who is also indigenous, heard that if I ended my life, I, would, I wouldn't be able to see my ancestors. So why is talking about suicide in the black community still taboo? When we talk about mental health and folks who are in crisis and police are our first responders and end up harming and or killing us, quite frankly, that's one of the reasons that it's still taboo to talk about suicide in, in our communities. Um, and then Kevin says, generation by generation, we've not been taught to process our feelings. We have not been taught to talk about our feelings. So how can we talk about suicide? Those are big feelings. Ashley says, instead of looking at the circumstance, people look at the indi individual and say, oh, you can get over it. Come on. Black people have been through it. If our ancestors went through this, decades of this, you know, what makes it your problem so bad that you can escape life? Because I toughed it out. You got to tough it out. And ID shares that, you know, sometimes we try to explain it away with colonized, westernized applications. So I asked, what was your experience trying to get help or talk to someone about what was going on with you? Karis tried to work on their struggles at home and could voice feeling sad or depressed, but would not disclose about voice hearing and um, or self-harm. Based on the negative portrayals of crazy people in the media as being unloved, Karis was really afraid. Um, Karis says, my big fear was my parents would actually not love me if I talked about those experiences with them. It wasn't until I was in my 40s that I talked to my family about it. Kara saw a black psychiatrist who attributed her problems to being too ambitious and suggested she may feel better if she settled into being a secretary. Um, and that wasn't about him being black, Kara says. It was really more about uh, his belief about the place of a woman. Ashley explained that she had night terrors as a little girl uh, or extreme emotional responses and, and was uncontrollable in school. And she was seen as a fighter and aggressive, but the aggression was a secondary emotion. Something else was happening inside. I self-harmed. Ashley explained that her family was afraid of how she would be treated in the system as a young black girl. And during a difficult episode when she was self-harming, her grandmother tried to intervene. My grandmother called the police to help calm me down and they took me to jail. I felt like my grandmother put me in jail. I was mad at her and she got mad at the system. She wasn't trying to punish me. She was like, I need to get her help. Why are you arresting her? When Morgan was 15, a hotline called law enforcement for an active rescue, but they didn't tell him what was happening. And it was really scary for them to be handcuffed and put in the back of a cop car. As a black person in America, it feels so dangerous. It feels so unsafe. Regardless of what police officer shows up, all I can see is their gun. And the first thought that crosses my mind is, am I going to be the next name on a list of unarmed black people killed by the police? Police officers don't need to be the first respondents to psychiatric emergencies. Morgan also talked about fear of the no unknown and that, you know, if they don't know what to expect, they're not going to reach out for help. So Kevin talked about having his first two black therapists were black and they thought he should have been over what he was struggling with the adoption because he was in church um, and he got adopted by a black family. Externally, everyone thought things matched up, but for him, he was still adopted and didn't look like anyone in his family was really struggling. ID shared that they had white therapists cancel appointments the day of not answer their door or tell Tell them that they, they don't have the bandwidth to work with patients who experience suicidal thinking. And watch at hospital is just like a juvenile facility. I was trying to survive the help they were giving to me. What do you wish mental health providers knew about being a black person dealing with suicidality? So this is a really important one. Um, I want to be clear that all black people aren't the same. This is wisdom from Ashley. We all have different experiences. My experience as a black woman who comes from gang violence, gun violence is going to be different from how I perceive a black girl who grew up with her mother and father. We are both dealing with suicide, but we're smashed together as one. 
Ashley recommends trauma-informed care approaches and partnering with Black therapists for context and adds that when you're dealing with suicide in a Black person, providers need to understand the history. They need to come to restorative justice, transformative trainings. And if you have a contract with the state or jails and you're doing healing work with punitive approaches, you're not helping. Ashley explained that because of past trauma with systemic racism that have harmed loved ones, many Black families are private. We, Black people, get looked at as keeping secrets from providers and therapists and not wanting to get help, but we're holding things sacred. I don't want, I don't think anyone wants to sit in isolation about suicide, but if I've relinquished my loved one to you, what are you going to do to them? The biggest self the biggest hurdle is self-stigma. I've been taught I can't have emotions or show emotions and then add being Black and having a mental health condition. Who is going to accept me? Kevin says you first have to validate that individual, validate that Black man, because we don't get validated enough. We just want to be accepted for who we are. Morgan said in moments of crisis, he wishes providers were transparent about what to expect, which is a tenant of trauma-informed care. Let your client know your concern. Tell them, hey, I don't think you're safe. Here are some options of what we can do. If we go to the hospital, here's what to expect. You're going to wait for a long time. You're going to see a medical doctor to clear you, to go to the psych ward, et cetera, et cetera. ID says we trust who we trust. Trust is earned, not given. And Kara says, I wish providers would take time to understand what's driving a person's need for desiring not to be here. There could be many reasons. It might be something we can't actually give words to immediately. We don't trust to give words to. Um, I, wish, I wish providers would recognize the impacts of racial trauma and the intergenerational impacts of racial trauma and discrimination and help to talk about those issues and how it impacts our mental health and well-being and why it may be that we're dealing with suicidality. All right. What advice would you give people who want to support a Black person who's struggling with suicidality? Have a level of, Kevin says, have a level of compassion, patience, and understanding. Pour hope into them. We don't have to have it all figured out. Um, and Kevin really says that he thinks Black men need a safe space to be created so they can open up and that we're going through years of unprocessed emotion. So having that safe space so the feelings can be heard and validated. Karis advises folks don't have the knee jerk reaction to hurt to call 911. You've heard about a lot of like law enforcement involved with black people dealing with suicidality. Um, being able to hear what the person is struggling with and just sitting with that person and letting them know they're not alone, connecting them to other black folks who've been through it. Um, ID suggests finding a black therapist for them um, or someone from a similar culture. Morgan says, ask your family member what they need from you. Um, sometimes I just needed someone to listen to me. I needed a hug. I needed to be left alone. What my family members think I need and what I actually need are two different things. And Karis really wanted psychosocial education that was culturally bound um, so that they could give that to their family members so that their family members could be supportive of them, but the family members wouldn't be alone in what they're going through. What do you dream for us? What has been most helpful for you? All right, let's get into what healing looks like. Um, I wish we had more availability of peers, family peers, community health workers, promotoras, barbershops, beauty salons, places where we naturally go to talk about the stuff that's going in our life and people being able to enter into those conversations and offer support and know when to refer if referring is necessary. Kevin says, creating safe space for black men to feel safe emotionally. Karis also says, having the community understand better social determinants of health, colonization that psychiatry is based upon, and to understand why people are, struggle to access conventional treatment. And Ashley says, every day we have to hear about a Black person being killed by police. It would be so helpful if we would be held as sacred human beings and not descendants of slaves that are angry as hell. Ashley always keeps it real. All right, this is what's been helpful for folks. Peer support, ancestral healing, restorative justice practices, trauma-informed therapy, Black therapists, people of color therapists, Christian therapists, and therapists who understand cultural humility and, and racism who might not identify as BIPOC. We don't all agree, but we agree that choices are important. So becoming an advocate is something that everyone had in common. Um, Community-based organizations are helpful, 12-step community, topic-specific groups, um, like for group support, like adoption, sexual assault survivors, 
culturally specific practices or culturally specific programs, meditation, prayer, spirituality, connecting specifically with other suicide attempt survivors, creating space to feel emotions, and sometimes medication. Kara said, I was very fortunate to have licensed providers who could think very far outside of the box without violating any of their regulations related to their licensure. Um, ID said, having a therapist who isn't a afraid to show their humanity, isn't afraid to have that conversation around suicide. Ashley's talked about restorative justice and ancestral healing spaces for survivors of violence. And for Kevin, online adoption support groups really changed their life um, to know that they're not alone in their struggle. And a Christian therapist has helped them. It may not be for everyone, but that has been so helpful for, for Kevin, um, along with medication. And Morgan created a weather safety crisis plan to communicate with loved ones and family members. We'll go look at Morgan's safety plan. I won't go through all of this, but um, I do want to say that like Morgan has a plan when they're in crisis and they communicate this with other folks, right? I'm doing all right. If it's a thunderstorm, tropical storm, it's I'm having passive thoughts and it escalates and escalates. And really the takeaway um, is that anything for a category three, they go to the hospital and they don't love the hospital. They says it's been unhelpful, but it is sometimes the only option because they don't have a mobile respite center. So people really do want respite centers. They want peer respite centers, et cetera. All right. I'm getting the time, the timer note that I, I need to start wrap up, start wrapping up. So what are the helpful things people have said or asked when they're collaborating with you? And again, you'll have access to this. I'm going to read just a few of them. But first, hold space and listen. Um, make it clear that you're there. You can say, I know you're going through it. It's difficult, but I have no doubt that you're going to get on the other side of this. You must be in so much pain. Give people choices and options. When you felt like this before, what was helpful? Um, and what's going to keep you around a little bit longer? What can I take off your plate? Can we get someone else involved? Can you have a family member come over? Is there a partner? Is there a friend who can come stay with you? And provide reminders of strategies that have helped in this space before. Choices are really important. All right, these are the takeaways. And then I wanna read something in closing so that we can turn it over to hear from you all. So it's important for black people dealing with suicidality to have voice, choice, and agency. The black community is not a monolith. Some of the survivors interviewed thrived working with black therapists and others thrived working with culturally responsive therapists, but the commonality was choice. And for providers and community members, it's important to know that a black person who's experienced stigma and racism and internalized stigma may be really strategic about disclosing. They may, they may use depression as code for suicide because depression may be safer to discuss without a potential negative impact from their loved ones or providers. So you might be talking to someone who's dealing with suicidality and who's also adept at survival and being really careful about language. Um, hands down, integrating lived experience and peer support. I can not say that enough. And peer support is not just including race. It also includes experience because we have diversity within our community. Racism impacts our mental health and we need providers to be well-versed in historical and systemic racism and be ready to talk about and understand what impacts Black folks um, without burdening their clients to educate them. And listen, Overwhelmingly, people have not listened to what is needed and they're in sa savior mode. So like slow down and listen. Um, and if we can skip to the very last, very, very last slide, I'm gonna steal a minute because I think it's important. Well, the slide with Ashley and her daughter. So I have calls to action. I have resources. I want you all to check them out. They're black specific. They're really important. But you just heard me say a lot I want to pour back into you this um, I wanted to share. And this is Ashley, who was reunited with her daughter, Tioni. I wrote this for a friend who was dealing with suicidal thoughts. And I'm just going to share a little bit of it. I once heard grief is love with no place to go. What are we going to do with this longing? Call on your ancestors with your highest intent. Ask for guidance. Ask for ease. Ask for spaciousness. Time travel through portals. Harness the power of melody. Try the medicine of tears, rest. With eyes of love, look in the mirror, be seen by you, speak an affirmation, fall in love with the miracle that is you. Gather sadness, depression, and anger in a room with no walls and ask them if they could release this pain, what would they dream for you? 
write down their responses, understand their needs, start working on releasing, call a friend, a coach, a therapist, and a healer, and whoever brings you energy sees you as whole and knows you already have the answers can manifest and stay, but manifest guides, not saviors. You may feel like breaking, but you are not broken. You are not broken. You break open. This feeling won't last forever, but while it's here, move through it, not around, ask for help, and then let them help you. Tell them no, you know who they are. Create space to fall apart and let yourself fall apart. Let yourself be held without holding. Let yourself be perfectly unperfect. Rest. And like a bird trapped in a building will find its way to sky, you will find your way to sky. Thank you so much for listening. All right. Turn it over to you for a minute, Dr. T. <laughs> Wow. Thank you so much, Kalechi. Thank you so much for pouring your entire self into that. And mm -hmm. if we were live, I would say give you a round of applause. But since everyone is muted, if we can just show Kalechi some love with some hearts in the chat. Thank you for bringing such light and such energy to this topic that is often taboo. And the more we don't talk about it, the more it's left to be other, the more it's left to be the boogeyman to be something scary and the more people are oppressed and lost in that silence. So thank you for elevating that. Thank you for your courage and for your bravery to, to share your story and the story of so many other black women and men and, and individuals. So we're thankful again for your time today and for your story. And we're gonna start, we have two individuals who have submitted questions. Um, we'll start with Ken, welcoming Ken to the stage. Hi, how are you doing today? Good, welcome, Ken. Sure, uh, I appreciate your lived experience. It brought a whole lot to um, your presentation today. I'm curious, as a younger you, your first exposure to the system of care with mental health, what would hope have looked like in those early days? You know, I think for me, it's not telling someone what their life trajectory is based off, based on what they're seeing. I think people see people at their worst and they're like, well, this is all you got. So I, I was told that I was broken and I would never heal and that, and I didn't want that identity. Hope would have been, you know, I've seen other people deal with this. You're not the only person who thinks this. I thought I was the only person who had suicidal thoughts. I thought it was just me. And having someone say, you're not the only person who deals with this. And here's how other people cope. Here's how other people have healed. Let's talk about what healing looks for you. Um, and as a young person, having peer support, having other young people who might have survived, or maybe they're like in their 20s and they're sharing their story. That see, When I first saw that other people had gone through it and were still here, I was like, oh my gosh. There's hope. There's hope in peers. There's hope in lived experience and peer support. And also therapists who believed in me, who were like, I know you feel like this, but you're not going to feel like this forever. I'm going to hold the hope until you have it. I hope that makes sense. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that, Kalechi. And it reminds me also of, of the artifacts that we have in our offices and in our organizations, outside of the stories and the peer support what are the images that we have on our walls and brochures? And you spoke to that around the graphics with people with their hands and their in their head. And it's like, how do we inspire hope through our brochures, through our wall posters and artifacts within the organization and hope that shows diversity, that it's not just singular hope, but it's hope and it looks like me. And it's something that I can identify with regardless of my walk in life or my situation. Awesome. So welcome Monroe to the stage. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, okay, cool. I didn't know it would work. Um, okay, so thank you so much for your um, presentation. And my question is in regards to if you're involved with any nationwide organizations like American Foundation for Suicide Prevention or National Alliance on Mental Illness. And if so, do you feel that they make Black communities feel welcome, supported, and heard? Woo! <laughs> you, you asked me a very political question. Um, I am not um, 
once I started working for myself, I was able to be a little bit more direct about my thoughts and feelings. Um, and what I'll say is that I think, I think there's certain narratives in national organizations that are accepted and certain narratives that aren't. So sometimes when you have a survivor come out and share their story, it's like, and then everything was fine. But I don't believe in saying things that aren't true. I And that has sometimes caused some tension um, in different spaces where there's only one narrative allowed, right? If I told you I was feeling suicidal in December, I might get kicked off the survivor group because I haven't survived right. So I think I, I wish there was more openness to talk about things. And I encourage these organizations to um, be more inclusive. And I would like to be part of more, um, but I think it's, you know, I don't necessarily fit in. So I don't try to fit, if that makes sense. No, thank you so much. Um, that's such a great perspective to hear from. Thank you. Thank you, Monroe. So we have another um, top question that has been upvoted, actually two. Um, one is how can we support people who are struggling with suicidal ideation partially because of frustration about structural racism in realizing that we all somehow contribute to perpetuating racism? Yeah, I think that's such a good question. I think part of it is education. Part of it is not burdening other people to educate you. But also, I think we racism bec has become like a really scary word. Like, oh my gosh, I'm I'm not racist. I'm good, right? And Yolo Akili, who you should definitely check out, who is the executive for, director of Beam, says, you know, we've all been taught. We've all been in a racist, misogynistic, transphobic, homophobic society. It's not, is this person racist? It's how does racism show up looking at it as a behavior that we can look at and work with instead of, again, we got cancel culture and some people, hey, that's, you know, I'm not even going to open that door. But essentially, like, how do we look at the behavior instead of saying I'm good and then just say I, I have things that I have to work on because I've learned them, internalized things from other groups. So I think part of it is recognizing that it's there and then also talking about it and saying, like, when I had white therapists tell me about racist things that were happening to me structurally that I'd never thought about, it was so powerful. I was like, this is allyship as a verb. You are showing me things I didn't even see. And I think that's everyone's work. Thank you so much. All right. Um, there's some questions around. So during your session, you mentioned ab about specifically about black people that a lot of times because it's such a taboo in our communities, we pretend to be happy. And so yeah. depression and, and suicidal ideation may look like a smile. It may look like laughter. It may look like play. And so how do you reach people who may be masking? What are the like, prevention or intervention strategies that you would suggest? Yeah, I think one thing is I'm I'm waiting for the campaign and I know it's out there somewhere that like depression looks like this and have people who are like joyfully laughing, almost like the social media when you look and I'm like, wow, everyone's so happy, but actually saying, this is me when I was at my lowest. Like, I think sometimes we need to change the narrative. The other thing is people stick a pinky toe out to see how you feel about things. And we may not know that they're, we're being tested. So I might say, you know, Dr. T, you know, I heard that this person died by suicide. What do you think about that? And if you say they are selfish and horrible and I'm feeling this way, I might be like, oh, I'm not telling her. Right. So I think sometimes it's also bringing the conversation in. Right. Saying like, hey, I want you to know I've been seeing this in the news. I've been seeing the rates. I I want you to know I'd be here if you'd ever need to talk about this, or I myself have struggled with thoughts and I just wanted to open the door. Sometimes being vulnerable and opening the door first makes, I mean, that's why I know so many black suicide attempt survivors is because they know that I am one. They might not tell anyone else, but they'll tell me. And, it, and I want them to tell other people. So I think being open, um, having people who look like folks um, and, and starting to message differently about like when these celebrities die by suicide and you hear these like that person's horrible or, you know, people need to interrupt these messages and give 
correct information because that makes other people say, oh, I'm never going to tell anyone. I'll, and we have to check on people who are smiling. That's the other thing. <laughs> like just because you're smiling doesn't mean you're not holding things. I want us to check on our caregivers. I want to check on the people who are always holding everyone, holding it all together. Wonderful. And we have something in our community that can say, check on your strong friends. Yeah. Check in on strong friends. Check in on all of our friends. Check in on each other. Mm -hmm. um, and I didn't want a mask. I was so tired. It was so much energy to pretend to be happy all the time and then break down somewhere else. I wanted someone to break through. But the other part is that help has to not be harmful. We can't have everyone come and say, okay, I'm disclosing and sharing. And then we put them in some, a situation that's harmful. So we have to work on those things as well. Thank you so much again, Kalechi. And I know we are at time mm -hmm. and hopefully this is not our final conversation about this, that we continue to have these conversations and hopefully you will say yes to come back to Intact and continue to share and provide space to, to continue this conversation for people to ask questions and to actually implement real practical strategies within their organizations, within their homes and within their communities. So thank you again. And please join me in sending hearts and love to Kalechi. And thank Ashley, welcome to the stage. Welcome back, Ashley. Thank you, everyone. I appreciate you all. That was, that was powerful. And that touched my heart in a special way. Um, I, I want to encourage folks in the room to uh, make sure you take advantage of the wellness room. I think I'm actually going to head over there after uh, just to decompress and to breathe. And we can use some of those yoga exercises that we learned from Shirley this morning as we take it into that space. Um, but knowing that it's so important to have these conversations, no matter how it may make us feel, it's important to talk about it. So thank you to Kalechi and thank you to um, Tanisha for, um, for, for that time and that space. Okay. So a couple of things before we move on through the rest of the, the day, again, reminding folks to engage in the platform. This summit can be, um, just a regular everyday, you know, webinar, or it can be something really meaningful, powerful connections, networking, if you engage. So I encourage you to please as you're here with us today, engage with the network and with other attendees. Um, another thing that we're doing is that we're encouraging people to read the feed, um, basically leaving posts in the feed and, and then let's all share and learn with one another. Uh, every morning uh, of the summit, I've been waking up, coming in a little early and reading the event feed and the messages that you all leave. So I wanna encourage you to do the same um, and leave a post answering the question, what does healing look like in your life? That's a question that Kalechi asked us and, and let's think on that and respond in the feed. Before we move on uh, to our concurrent sessions, just a, a little sneak peek into the rest of the day, uh, we will have concurrent sessions after this break. And then we will have a keynote presentation by Jane Singer around trauma and healing. And we're really excited to honor some of our system of care champions. This year, we're having the first ever system of care award ceremony here uh, at the summit. And I'm excited to um, honor and acknowledge, and I, I, I invite you to join me in congratulating um, Rick. Uh, he is our uh, youth champion, uh, and we will have uh, an award ceremony honoring and celebrating him and his work. And uh, he also has a lightning talk, y'all. So over this break, I encourage you to go over to the lightning talks and, and listen to his. It's really good. Um, and I also like to um, recognize and honor uh, the next award winner. Uh, which is our star organization, um, Centro Unido Latino Americano organization. They've won uh, the System of Care Star Award Organization Award. Um, and so again, after Jane's keynote, we'll have that award ceremony. And y'all, it's not just your typical, you know, I want to thank my mom and, and I want to thank my cat Fluffy. We love Fluffy. We love our, our moms, but 
Uh, we're actually going to make even the award ceremony an opportunity to learn and share. So you'll want to uh, stay online for the award ceremony so we can honor and uplift those who are champions um, in our community. Okay, so read the feed. That's up next. Uh, the prompt is in the feed right now. So before you go and grab water or when you come back, make sure you respond to the read the feed uh, and we'll see you after this break. Take care.